Okay. So with that, I just wanted to go over a couple of quick uh, Zoom controls. So if you are on a laptop uh, or a PC, uh, you should have uh, controls down on the bottom left hand side of your screen. Uh, those are how you mute or start your video. Again, we're asking everyone to keep those uh, both off so that we can get a nice clean recording. Uh, there are some boxes down at the bottom, like if you need um, the transcript, uh, you can click on that uh, button uh, to have that pop up. Um, and just some other like chat box, we'll be using the chat box to interact. If you have questions, uh, feel free to go ahead and give that a try. Uh, we've put a few messages in there already. Um, and as I said at the beginning, uh, these are brunch and learn series are being sponsored by the Deep Creek Watershed Foundation, and they are being facilitated by University of Maryland Extension in Garrett County. And with that, I just wanted to do a couple of quick introductions to the University of Maryland Extension and some of the programs that we work with. Uh, my name is Ashley Bodkins, and I do work with the Master Gardener program here in Garrett County, as well as Home Horticulture. Uh, we are rolling out a program that's called WaterWise that Deep Creek Watershed Foundation also helped to sponsor and get that program here, which very closely mimics uh, the BayWise program. Uh, so that is being uh, rolled out officially uh, this, this month here in Garrett County. So if that's something that you're interested in or if you have uh, conservation landscaping practices that you're doing on your landscape, uh, we encourage you to reach out to our office uh, so that we can try to get you um, enrolled in that program. Uh, just a quick note about um, our programming is open for all with University of Maryland Extension. Uh, so we wanna make sure that everyone is um, knows that our programming is open and if you need accommodations or anything like that we encourage you to reach out to us and with that i am going to turn it over for a minute uh, to david meyerberg the president of deep creek watershed foundation uh, to say a couple of quick words all right i'm unmuted good morning to everyone so glad that you could join us today um, the Deep Creek Watershed Foundation uh, funds a lot of different things in the Deep Creek Watershed, and this is one of them, and we hope that you enjoy this. Ashley Bodkins from the University of Maryland Extension uh, in Garrett County um, has been very, very helpful in getting all this organized and together, um, and uh, we hope that this is going to be a great presentation once again and that we will have a few others through the season. Uh, these will be announced on our website. And please, if you haven't, take a look at the Deep Creek Watershed Foundation website, um, which is shown here in the picture. Um, it tells everything about the foundation that you'd ever want to know. Uh, and there's some very interesting videos uh, that, uh, that you might like to see, including some of the lunch and learns that have been uh, presented in the past. Uh, so thank you very much, Ashley, and um, onward and upward. Uh, this page shows you the Deep Creek Watershed Foundation website um, at the bottom, um, and uh, you can just uh, get into that easily. And then if you're interested, the Deep Creek Watershed Foundation is basically governed um, by the goals of the Deep Creek Watershed Plan. Uh, and we give you that website here so you can take a look at that. Um, and uh, uh, any other sh slides there? Uh, yeah, today we move on to our first, our speaker, Matt Sell, who is uh, from the Maryland DNR Fisheries. And uh, he has a great presentation ready for you guys today. Matt. Okay, here I am. Can everyone see and hear me? I'll take. Yes, we I, I, can. We're ready for you to share your screen anytime. Okay, sounds great. I'll quick introduce myself. Uh, I'm Matt Sell. I am the Western Regional Fisheries Manager for West Region 1. Uh, covers Allegheny and Garrett counties, including uh, Deep Creek Lake, obviously. So um, with that, I'm going to try to not mess this up. And get you to my presentation. Yeah, I, uh, I guess, uh, 
we'll kick this off with, I, I mentioned I manage the fisheries resources here in Western Maryland, Allegheny and Garrett counties. Obviously that includes Deep Creek Lake, uh, which is gonna be the, the topic of conversation today. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about some of the walleye management um, work that we that we have ongoing on the lake uh, started last year, ongoing through this year. And um, yeah, so that's gonna be the topic of conversation. Uh, next slide there, Ashley. Okay, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Deep Creek Lake is, uh, it's a high elevation impoundment here in the heart of Garrett County. At full pool, it covers roughly 3,900 uh, 3, acres. And it is a hydroelectric uh, reservoir that's operated by Brookfield Renewable. Uh, but in addition to be a high, being a hydroelectric source, uh, it is also an extremely popular tourist area uh, and specifically for uh, boaters and anglers. Obviously, me being who I am, I am focused uh, largely on the angling component of that. Uh, so next slide, Ashley. Uh, talking about the Deep Creek Lake fishery itself, uh, it's what we refer to as a two-story fishery. So it supports a cold water and uh, warm water fish community. Now that fish community is dominated by cool and warm water fish species. Uh, and Deep Creek has a, a pretty good reputation as being a very, very high quality panfish fishery. So there are um, abundant and very large yellow perch, bluegills, uh, pumpkin seeds. Uh, it also is home to uh, a number of different game fish species, the most abundant of which are smallmouth bass and walleye, but we also have uh, largemouth bass, we have northern pike, chain pickerel, and some trout in the lake as well. So, next slide. The, uh, as mentioned before, the topic of conversation for today uh, is going to be the walleye. Uh, and just a, a brief biology, ecology, history lesson uh, for walleye. Again, for those that you, those of you who may not know a lot about them, uh, they're members of the family Percidae. Uh, some other members of that family would include yellow perch, sauger, and the European cousin, the Xander. And uh, the walleye specifically, uh, they, they typically spawn when water temperatures get into the low to mid 40 degree range. And uh, here in Deep Creek Lake, that's often basically right now through about the first part of April, which uh, is why we have a closed season from March 1 until April 15. So uh, we're trying to protect those spawning fish. Now, uh, males are, are typically more precocious than females. They'll mature at around age three, where females are going to mature at around age four on average. And uh, spawning is, is promiscuous. Uh, oftentimes, you're going to see a number of males surrounding a female that's depositing eggs, attempting to fertilize them. And uh, once those eggs are, are deposited, uh, they're, they're usually laid over a gravelly substrate. And the eggs are adhesive and they'll stick to the rocks, they'll stick to those little spaces and will mature usually in about two to three weeks. And that's going to depend largely on the water temperature uh, during the time that they've uh, since they've been laid. Now, once the, the little fry walleyes hatch out, uh, they're going to be uh, what we refer to as a sack fry. Uh, so they have a little yolk sack on them that sustains them nutritionally until their mouth parts develop to the point where they can transition to a largely plankton diet and they'll stay on plankton until they get big enough to start to transition to uh, smaller insects and things and as adults they're omnivorous uh, but mostly piscivorous uh, meaning that they're they're going to eat mostly other fish as part of their diet as adults now Walleyes can exceed lengths of 30 inches and weights of over 15 pounds, and for that reason, they're extremely popular as uh, as a sport fish. But also, uh, if you'll advance to the next slide, you'll see that they are uh, very, very popular as um, as table fare as well. Uh, walleye are very delicious. Uh, they have a very light, flaky meat that uh, is sought after by many, many anglers including my son there in that picture. Um, but they, uh, uh, for that reason, exploitation rates and harvest rates can be very high for legal size walleyes. So with that, uh, diving on into some of the, some of the work that we're doing. Um, 
Looking at the walleye fishery, specifically in Deep Creek Lake, uh, it's characterized as being very abundant. There's a lot of fish out there. However, it doesn't have what we would consider an ideal size distribution. And what I mean by that is it's dominated by smaller sublegal size fish. And if you look at the graph there on the left, that's a length frequency distribution. You'll see that there's a lot of fish collected in the smaller size classes. However, once you get to around 17 inches, those fish largely disappear from our samples. Um, they show up occasionally, but uh, there's obviously a drop off there. And another way to kind of kind of look at your size classes and get a feel for what the size distribution looks like in any fishery population is something that's referred to as proportional size distribution or PSD. And those two little tables on the right, you'll see that the based on our recent data, the PSD value uh, for walleyes in the lake is 42. Now, uh, just a little bit of background about PSD. It is the proportion of PSD itself is a proportion of quality size fish or 15 inch and larger walleyes to the total number of adult fish or nine inch and larger walleyes in the lake. So that number 42 basically says that 42% of the walleye of the adult walleyes in Deep Creek are 15 inches or greater, which a PSD of 42 for most exploited game fish populations is not bad. What you start to see, though, as you dig a little bit deeper, is that uh, the, the table below that are incremental size uh, distributions. So we're looking at the number of fish incrementally between those size groups. So how many are stocked to quality, how many are quality to preferred, and then uh, memorable and trophy is what the M and the T stand for. And you'll see that uh, the large majority of the fish are between 9 and 15 inches or in the stock to quality increment. And 38% of, of the fish are in that quality to preferred increment, so 15 to 20 inches. But looking at that with that length frequency on the left, you'll see that, um, again, the, the fish largely disappear right around 17 inches. So very few of those fish are making it to the uh, memorable, the preferred memorable and trophy size classes, or basically 20 inches and greater. So next slide. So um, in order for us to uh, kind of understand that better, and the takeaway from that previous slide is basically that there's one of two things going on there. Either you have a really slow growth, which is unlikely in, in Deep Creek, or you have a high harvest rate, or you have maybe a combination of both. The first thing we needed to determine was, was growth rate for the walleyes in the lake. So starting last year in 2021, uh, my staff and I started pooling otoliths from harvested walleye during the opening weekend of walleye season. And we also uh, harvested a few fish ourselves uh, while conducting surveys to fill in some of the data gaps that, that we had. Uh, basically, an otolith is just a small bone that, that grows in the fish that we can remove. We break it in half, and when viewed under a microscope and prepared properly, um, it has rings on it just like you would age, age a tree, you count the rings that are annuli, and that gives us an age for the fish. So the objective of that was to be able to determine the age at length uh, for, for the walleye fishery. And from that, we can uh, calculate growth rates and ultimately mortality rates once we have all that age data. So uh, next slide, Ashley. And I'm flying without my notes on presenter view here. So if I forget something, um, there will be opportunities for questions by all means, uh, hit me up. But uh, so the, the first bit of information that we were able to get from that um, is the growth rate. Uh, this is a Von Bertalanthe growth function or growth curve. And you can see on the X axis, uh, you have age in years on the Y axis or the one going up is uh, length in millimeters. And early on in their lives, fish grow faster and that curve starts to flatten out as the fish gets older and slow uh, growth begins to slow. So this is the growth curve for the walleyes based on the data that we've collected so far. Uh, uh, next slide. The first key point to look at is where that star is at and that is 3.8 years of age. That is the age on average that walleyes reach the legal minimum size of 381 millimeters or 15 inches in Deep Creek Lake. 
Uh, again, this supports more of a moderate growth rate, not a slow growth rate. So it's kind of getting us away from the idea that these fish just aren't growing fast enough to make it to the larger size classes. If you go to the next slide, Ashley. Uh, this is another important point, and that is the break from the um, quality size to preferred size or the 20 inch mark, and that's 8.8 .8 years of age. Now, understanding that that both of these may change a little bit, but that that age at 20 inches may be adjusted as we collect more data, because as you can imagine, there's not as many big fish in the lake. So our sample size for age at length of those larger fish is smaller than those smaller size classes. So um, that that value may change. But as it stands right now, uh, we're looking at 8.8 .8 years to get a fish to 20 inches, which again is, is a moderate growth rate. So next slide, Ashley. Uh, the other thing we can do with our age data is uh, generate a catch curve. And this is basically a count of the number of fish in each age class. So if you look down at the x-axis, it's age in years again, and the y-axis is simply the number of fish that we have in each one of those age groups. And uh, what we can learn from a catch curve is uh, the slope of that curve is going to give us the mortality rate of the um, of that fishery and uh, where that curve intersects the X axis way out there to the right gives us an estimate of the theoretical maximum age or the oldest that the fish can get in the population. So next slide, Ashley. Uh, in this case, based on the data that we have so far, again, understanding that we need to get some more older age class fish to really fill in that part of the curve. Um, we, we've, uh, we've been able to calculate the natural mortality rate at about 37%. Now that falls within the range of a number of freshwater fishes, uh, and that is death from natural causes. Basically, around 37% of the fish uh, across the board, regardless of age, on average, are going to die within that given year. That's the annual mortality rate. Um, likewise, the maximum age right now is approximated to be just about 14 years of age. Again, I keep going back to it, but we need a little bit more data from those older fish to really shore that, that estimate up. Now, looking at the mortality, the important thing to understand about mortality rates is that there are two primary components. You're going to have natural mortality. Then in addition to that, you're going to have angling related mortality in an exploited fish population. So walleyes, again, going back to those early slides, they're very popular as table fare among anglers and uh, across their range, harvest rates by anglers of legal size fish are typically fairly high. So in order to really understand the total amount of mortality that this fishery is seeing from one year to the next, we have to have both natural mortality as well as angling mortality. I'm going to touch on that in just a few slides. So um, uh, go on to the next one. Now, uh, again, looking at that length frequency distribution, uh, we've already established that growth rates are moderate and don't appear to be controlling this fishery, but yet, we don't see those fish in the larger size classes. Now, looking at our historical data, going back about 15 years or so, um, we have, uh, from the database, I was able to pull 4,994 records of walleyes collected during fishery surveys. Of those almost 5,000 walleyes, only 97 of the fish collected exceeded 20 inches, or that preferred size class and larger. Uh, which is less than 2% overall. In our recent surveys, um, we saw only about 3% of the fish exceeding 20 inches, which falls right in line with our long-term number. However, we do have records of fish in recently, in, in, in just a few years uh, past, uh, we have fish that have ex exceeded 26, 28, and uh, even a fish or two over 29 inches in length. So the potential is there to grow larger fish, but what the heck is happening to them? Where, why aren't they showing up anywhere, including our anglers who typically report catching a lot of just sublegal fish and very few legal sized and, and even fewer really large walleyes. So next slide, Ashley. 
you'll notice that vertical red line right there. That is approximately where the 15 inch size is. And you'll notice that once fish get to 15 inches, there are still a few around, but start to disappear very, very quickly. And this is, this is indicating to us that we do have high exploitation rates or high harvest rates of the walleyes in this fishery. Basically, they're able to get to legal minimum size and there's still a decent number of fish right at legal minimum to about 17 inches, but beyond 17 inches, they start to disappear quickly. So uh, with that, in order to best understand what that harvest rate is, next slide, Ashley, um, we are in the process right now. And if you notice the way I was dressed, I jumped off the boat to come give this presentation and I'm getting back out on the boat as soon as I'm done. Uh, we're in the process right now of tagging 450 walleyes in the lake. And the purpose of that, the objective is to determine what the overall harvest rate is for these legal size fish in larger. And we'll have those fish at large as anglers catch them. My phone number is written on the tag as well as a tag number. And if an angler catches a tag fish, we're asking them to call the number, report the tag number, uh, as well as the day that they caught it, where they caught it approximately on the lake. We don't need GPS coordinates necessarily. Uh, but the most important component of that is, was the fish released or was it harvested? And with that, we're going to be able to uh, determine what the exploitation rate is uh, for this fishery. Um, now, concurrent to that, because you can imagine that some anglers may not see the tag. Some anglers may see the tag and say, I don't want to participate. Other anglers may write down the tag number, lose the number. They, they may forget to call it in. There's going to be a certain bias associated with that. So concurrently with this, we're going to also do a postcard survey where we'll hand out a known quantity of postcards to anglers on the lake. And the number of those that we get back will allow us to account for non-reporting bias or those walleye tags that get caught that aren't reported. So uh, next slide, Ashley. Again, I mentioned we're out on the lake right now. This picture was taken uh, less than 24 hours ago. And uh, that's what the tags look like. They're about three inches long. They're yellow. They have my phone number and a tag number on them. Uh, they will with time. The longer they're in the lake, those tags will grow algae and they'll turn kind of brown. Obviously, they're, they're all brand new right now, so I don't have a picture to show you of that. But um, it, they're a little bit harder to see whenever they get the algae on. But all you have to do, uh, if anybody asks, just take your thumbnail and scrape the algae away and all the information will be there. So um, that's what a tag fish looks like. Uh, next slide, Ashley. And um, finally, anglers who do take the time to participate and report a tagged walleye that they catch, uh, they'll be entered into a drawing for one of uh, 10 $50 prepaid Visa gift cards, which uh, this day and age might cover the cost of your gas to get there. But um, we're hoping that, uh, that, that some folks uh, see that and it helps to incentivize getting some tag returns so that we can get the best data possible. So next slide, Ashley. Uh, looking forward. So with the abundance data that we have, our age growth, catch and harvest data that we are currently collecting, what we're planning to do with all that information is we can model different management scenarios uh, using that data and have a pretty good feel for how the fishery is going to react under different management scenarios or different regulations is ultimately what it boils down to. So what we're hoping to do is take all that information, we'll come up with a couple of different scenarios, and then we're going to scope the idea with our stakeholders. We're going to take it out to the public. We're going to say, here's the options. We can leave it status quo and you'll continue to catch a lot of walleyes, but you may struggle to catch legal size fish and you probably won't catch nearly as many larger fish as what we could if we make change A, change B, change C. And uh, with that, the, the hope is that we see a clear cut winner that, that all of the stakeholders like, and we can, we can move forward. Um, but again, uh, we're in the process right now of collecting the data that we need to uh, generate those different uh, management scenarios and take it to the public. So um, I guess final results to be determined but I would anticipate uh, probably about a year from now, 
uh, you'll, you'll start to hear a little bit more about what we've done, what we found, and what we are uh, thinking to try to do. So with that, I'm going to stop talking. Um, I have time for a few questions here. I've got about 10 minutes before I've got to get back on the water. But uh, if you think of something afterwards, uh, which is generally how I operate, uh, there is my name. That's my office number and my email address. Honestly, email is going to be the best way to get me. I'm checking that more often right now than my office line because we are we are going hard at it with field season. So um, it's uh, uh, it's going to be a little harder to get me on the office line for the next uh, probably three months or so. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer questions. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Matt. That was awesome. We, I've, I really learned a lot. So thank you for that great presentation. Um, we do have one question in the chat box, and it is, uh, what are the catch and release rules on the lake? Currently, there, there are no catch and release rules on the lake necessarily. Uh, we do have a legal minimum size of 15 inches, and that's in place from April the 16th through February 28th, 29th inclusive, and that's the walleye season. Uh, all walleyes are closed to harvest regardless of size from March the 1st until April the 15th inclusive each year. That's the closed season for the spawn. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Um, in the past, there were warnings about mercury in fish. Don't eat them. Is that sounds as if it's not still true. Is that correct? You can the, there are consumption advisories for different fish species uh, that Maryland Department of the Environment publishes on their website. And you can look it up to see if that is the case. Um, different fish species accumulate mercury in different ways based upon their ecology. Um, fish that are piscivorous, such as walleyes, largemouth bass, uh, they tend to bioaccumulate mercury more than other fish species because little fish eat the snails and things and live in those areas where the mercury is more prevalent. The little fish get eaten by the bigger fish and it bioaccumulates up the chain. My advice to you would be to get on MDE's website and navigate to their fish consumption advisories and you'll be able to find out. Uh, they'll give fish consumption advisories and then often it'll be uh, so many meals for this body of water are acceptable for this, this fish species per month. So that information is out there. Um, I see the next question is, uh, um, is the abundance of northern pike related to the size or no? Um, you had some neighbors ask. Uh, that northern pike fishery is, um, it's an interesting one in the lake. And that's uh, really one of my first big projects actually was a uh, northern pike uh, research project there on the lake. And right now the northern pike fishery uh, seems to be expanding. Uh, we're learning about it. We've been studying it specifically for, uh, I guess, about, oh, geez, it's been seven years now. It doesn't feel like that long. But um, we're not sure, and in, in I'm not just dodging a question, we're not sure how that northern pike fishery behaves at this point. And specifically, I'm talking about how the recruitment uh, behaves, whether it's more of a pulsed recruitment where they get a good year class every so often, or whether it is um, that the habitat in the lake is changing. And specifically, the uh, submerged aquatic vegetation community has been changing through time in the lake. And in recent years, there have been some species of SAV that, um, that the pike really, really like. And that may, may be allowing them to get more consistent year classes off. And the, there's a dynamic there, undoubtedly. Northern pike are an apex predator. They are also piscivorous. They're going to be eating mostly other fish. But one thing to really understand about Deep Creek is I mentioned that it's very popular as a uh, quality panfish fishery. And part of the reason that it is so good for panfish is that it's also somewhat predator heavy. And uh, yellow perch are across the board for both walleyes and the northern pike are going to be largely the preferred prey species in the lake. 
Uh, there are some golden shiners that get to a pretty large size. And again, understanding they're opportunistic, they'll eat other species, but yellow perch are a very important forage base. Um, and by controlling the yellow perch numbers, uh, you, you limit their opportunity to stunt and it maintains that quality component of their fishery. So it really is a balance. And I guess with the pike thing, uh, we're, we, we do have our thumb on that pulse. We're paying attention to it. And the answer, the best answer I can give you is to be determined at this point. Uh, see, is there a need for increasing the amount of prey fish? I, I just kind of touched on that. Uh, we do have an abundance of yellow perch that uh, seem to be the, the basis of the, the, the forage base, the primary forage base in the lake. Uh, we are going to be looking at some dietary things in the future to verify that for sure. Uh, again, there's golden shiners throughout the lake. Uh, smallmouth bass have abundant crayfish in the lake. So at this point, there's no real need that, that we see to introduce any sort of forage base. Um, what is the best bait to use for walleye? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Do I want to give up all my secrets? Uh, I would say that... Uh, that can depend on time of year, the mood of the fish, where they're at in the water column, uh, the depth that they're at. During the early spring when these fish are very shallow and in the mood for spawning, I generally am throwing some sort of a small jig, um, whether it's a curly tail grub, a small paddle tail, or uh, a suspending jerk bait of sorts that uh, again, they're piscivorous. They're looking for that kind of stuff. Uh, those are my two go-tos in the spring. Uh, again, jigging is good year round, regardless of depth. Suspending jerk baits, maybe not so much as the fish will sometimes move deeper uh, during uh, summer months and during the winter. Um, but uh, yeah, I could talk, honestly, I could talk all day on what's the best bait to use, but day in, day out, uh, a small jig is really, really good or a shiner under uh under a bobber or just you know sunk to the bottom uh along weed lines or a little bit deeper it is going to get you going to get you some walleyes uh why are yellow perch more of a forage fish than bluegills or other sunfish and also are there any muskies or tiger muskies in the lake um yellow perch uh i don't know i'm, I'm not a walleye i'm not a pike uh but based on other dietary studies that i've read yellow perch are typically preferred. It probably has to do with body shape and your bluegill and sunfish are a lot deeper bodied. They have very big, very sharp spines that stick up. They're a little bit harder for a fish to get turned in their mouth and swallow head first that folds those spines back as they swallow them. Whereas yellow perch are, um, they're a little bit longer, more cylindrical. So they, they fit in the mouth better. Uh, I'm, I'm drawing off of, uh, some of what I know, and, uh, that's probably the best answer I can give you on that right now. Uh, muskies and tiger muskies. No, uh, it is, uh, I've heard a number of reports about muskies and tiger muskies in the lake. There are none. Uh, I have personally caught a hybrid, a tiger muskie is a hybrid between a Northern pike and a muskellunge. We do have hybrids that are a cross between the northern pike in the lake and the chain pickerel, which are a really interesting fish. They're, they're, they're unique. They're easy to identify if you know what you're looking for, but if you don't, they're not. Uh, but no, short, I guess that's not a short answer. The long answer is that there are no muskies or tiger muskies in the lake. Just northern, northern pike and chain pickerel are the only esauces in there. So that's the last question. Anybody else? I'm doing my best. I'm going fast to get through these. I'm sorry. I, uh, like I say, I've got a crew of guys on, on the lake that are waiting for me to get back. So I don't mean to rush. I'm just, uh, the, no. the irony being, I'm, 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 I'm okay. talking about the walleye tagging that, that my guys are out doing right now. So no worries. No, I think you did. That's wonderful. We appreciate the, the question and answers and, um, it's a great presentation, Matt, and we really appreciate the information and we will uh, be sending out a follow-up, um, a link with the recording and all that information. And, um, I'll include your email, um, in that email, uh, so that people can get in touch with you if they have questions. Okay. Okay. No, that, like <laughs> I say, that sounds great. My contact info is at the end. Shoot me an email, give me a call. Um, I'm happy to talk fish, fishing, fisheries, all of it. Uh, thank you for the compliments and the comments yeah. there. 
in the in the chat um yep uh next one on bass uh when we start <laughs> doing some bass work maybe i uh, i'm doing some bass work down in broadford but um that's uh that's outside of the the scope of the the foundation i believe so um <laughs> yeah but if we All do right, some bass well, work i'm happy to talk about it <laughs> that sounds great we will put you online well, okay. uh, thank you so much and you have a great afternoon and thank you all for joining us and we will uh, be in touch with our next uh, brunch and learn series uh, here in the next few weeks okay all right well you all have a great day and again thanks for joining us thanks matt great presentation hey glad to do it thank you all for taking your time